top executive coach down in LA. And uh, thank you so much for being on today, Shreen. Yeah, thanks for having me here. So in order uh, to get like a really nice introduction to you, let me read it out so that everybody really knows who you are and how we can connect you to what App Academy does here. So you learned and uh, studied from CIA field agents, hostage negotiators, and many other masters of persuasion to learn influential communication techniques. Some of your clients include top athletes, TV personalities, and entrepreneurs. Uh, and you've also helped people tap into their personal influence, business, and, uh, and their career influence. Uh, and today, uh, you wrote an article for the App Academy blog uh, on the one mental block that's holding people back mm -hmm. from being a great entrepreneur. And we'll get to that article later, but for now, uh, I want to talk to you, and I'd like for you, if possible, to tell us a little bit in California, and especially now, uh, you know, in the 2000s. Sure. So what I focus on is influential communication skills. So how is it that entrepreneurs, business owners, and leaders of all types can tap into the true power that we all have as human beings, which is communication. It's the one skill set that can literally change minds, can change societies, can change the world. And yet it's probably the one skill set that we take for granted because we've been doing it before we were like two years old. And so there's so much power in there that we just tend to not dig deep into. And I actually did. So being super nerd and super curious and, uh, just having a little bit of gumption, I decided to interview master influencers. And those people include CIA field operatives, like you mentioned, hostage negotiators, con artists even, military intelligence officers, um, trial attorneys with amazing win records, all of these people who quite literally face life and death situations depending upon how they communicate, what they say, how they say it. Mm -hmm. And my job is to take everything I learned from those amazing people because they're playing in the major leagues and just bring it down to the minors where you and I sit of, we just want to make some more money. Like, <laughs> and so, but those exact same skills that they have, those exact same techniques are what we can do as business owners, as people who want to elevate our careers um, to be better leaders and to achieve more in our life because ultimately we always need to convince people to be on our team, on board with our project or idea. And if you don't know how to do that, then you really miss out. Right. So that, I mean, that sounds like an incredible uh, and really fun job that you have. Yeah. Uh, I'd love for you to start off with maybe providing some examples of people that you worked with. It doesn't have to be specific and you obviously don't have to name anybody, but uh, I'd love for you to, to maybe provide an example of somebody that you uh, maybe have really learned from about some of the top influencing techniques and how it actually connects to how they do their job. Sure. So probably the, the group of people that I love to refer to the most is the CIA field agents. Mm -hmm. Mostly because one, they're amazing individuals. Two is that the CIA and, and other intelligence agencies around the world focus on the scientific data and and field testing these things so if there's any group of people that has put more effort into this i mean there is none it's those organizations so with that said um the one thing i was most surprised by every single time when i would interview these people is how first of all, normal they are. <laughs> you kind of expect them to have a bit of arrogance to them or a bit of I know more because I've seen more and done more because they have. And yet they tend to be, especially the field operatives, tend to be very quiet and patient mm. and, and they listen and they're, they're like, they look like insurance agents, to be perfectly frank. <laughs> like, uh -huh. They just seem like normal people. And what I learned most from them is that they are constant learners. During my interviews, they would even ask me like, well, what do you think about that? What would you do in that scenario? And I'm like, why are you asking me anything? And, yeah. Yeah. and that type of way of approaching people and situations, quite frankly, applies to everything. So it boils down to that these people, master influencers, are not nearly as concerned with the question, 
what should I say? They are much more concerned about the question, what do I need to know? Mm. What do I need to know about this person? What is influential to them? What are their experiences? What is the context? That is what they are searching for. And of course, within my business, we have frameworks and everything that we teach our clients to help them answer that question more fully. So then the answer to what should I say easily reveals itself. Really interesting. So when it comes to what should you say and what should you do, um, can you connect that back to potentially, you are dealing with really, you know, people that have already had a lot of experience, a lot of education, a lot of personal success that maybe are going for the next bump. But like you mentioned earlier, you want, you know, if people are starting out, they could definitely benefit from a lot of this type of advice. So I'd love it if you could think about somebody potentially that is coming through a boot camp that maybe has switched careers mm -hmm. and that uh, I'm sure maybe are lacking some confidence. Maybe it's an English major, right? Mm -hmm. That went to, you know, uh, a UC uh, uh, university or something like that. Mm -hmm. And yet they want to take advantage of all this high earning potential in Silicon Valley through technology. Mm -hmm. What are some of the tips that you could provide for that, you know, uh, that potential person that is thinking about that, that is going to have to go through a really long process to get, you know, get their skills in, get a new job, and then working inside of that job to get to a higher space. What are some of the things that you talk about? So the three-step process to influence boils down to observe, connect, influence. So influence is that three-step process, and yet most people just want to jump straight into influence, which is the worst thing that you can do. Again, that's operating from the question of what should I say? So let's go back to step one. Step one is observe. That means pay attention, ask questions, and simply be present with the, those people that you want to influence at some point. So whether it's observing the business that you want to be hired by, checking out their website, checking out their social presence, um, a decision maker within the company that you already are in, a boss, your boss's boss. What can you, how can you watch them, learn about them, discover things about them so that way your message can be more compelling to them? Now, we don't have obviously a whole lot of time on this interview to go through all the formulas and everything. However, one of the best things that you can ask yourself is looking for the influential vibes. That's V-I-B-E-S. I've got a really extensive blog post on this on the website. Uh, if anybody wants to dive deep, but the basics are this. You want to be concerned about what do they value? That's the V in vibes. What's important to them? What are their, what's their core operating system of what's good, what's bad, what's right, what's wrong, what's of interest, what's absolutely useless? What, where is their compass? And that's their values. The second is I in vibes, and that's going to be identifier. So mm. how do they see themselves? What labels do they put on themselves? Um, job titles, roles in their life, wife, mother, uh, single person, millennial, you know, any of those things. Mm -hmm. All the way to labels I regularly put myself, as, as you can see from Doctor Who and Captain America over here, is I'm a nerd. And I'm glad, I love that label. And so somebody that might talk about nerdy things would appeal to me because that's a label that they could observe about me. Third is going to be beliefs. So what do they believe about for specific things? What do they believe about a problem that you are hoping to solve for them? And if you're looking for a job, you're solving a problem for them. So what beliefs do they have about that problem? Um, what beliefs do they have about the solution that you are proposing? I can be the perfect person for this job. So what do they believe about that? Could you be the right person? Are you qualified enough? Can you validate any of those beliefs or do you need to debunk any of those beliefs? Hmm. The third belief is going to be, what do they believe about their role in this particular situation? Do they believe they should be extremely involved? Do they believe that they shouldn't have their hands on this? Mm -hmm. What do they believe about their role? And then lastly is, what do they believe about you? Do they know you from Adam? Like, mm. well, are you a known factor or not? Are you a referral? So really diving into those, that's the B. La or next is going to be the emotional triggers. What puts this person in a positive state? What puts this person in a negative state? 
Mm. There's pros and cons to both. And lastly is what are their secret goals and desires? Now I say secret simply because it sounds sexier, but really and truly can be stated goals and desires as well. So what is it that they're achieving? All of us are reaching for something more, want something more for ourselves, our family members, our loved ones, our company. So Mm -hmm. what goals do they have? Now you just align what is it that I have to offer and my strengths with their values, identifiers, beliefs, emotional triggers, and secret goals and desires. Mm -hmm. And then there's your influential message. That was a whole lot. I totally get that for your watchers and listeners. Check out the blog article if you want more information then write a comment or something and I'll help you out. But that's one of the most powerful frameworks to observe about somebody else. It's interesting that that sounds to me like a great process. And I wonder if you also talk with your clients about using that same process to observe your own process, your own self as you go through your own life and your career. Uh, I think, you know, sometimes it's probably we're too self-involved in our own careers and our own uh, goals, but Mm -hmm. it'd probably be great to do that type of self-introspection, right? Um, And maybe also ask if, uh, I don't know what you know, what do you think about this, but maybe also ask other people to potentially help you uh, do that for yourself to to really help you um, come up with those for yourself. Absolutely. I mean, you definitely connected a dot that a lot of people don't. And that is when people come to me, obviously the things that they're searching for is I want to enhance my brand. I want to make more money. I want to raise my fees. I want to leverage my marketing, all areas, communication and influence. But without fail, every single one of my clients, once we go through the process at some point, we'll say, you know, I never thought of this, but just the other day I was talking to my wife and something, 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 and they learn about themselves. They learn more about how they personally communicate, how that's interpreted by the world. And then they learn how to make those adjustments that serve their ultimate goal. Mm -hmm. So it absolutely, you cannot, and that's another thing I will say to your first question of what was the things that you learned? Master influencers tend to be, there's always exceptions tend to be very self-aware individuals Mm. that because they are constantly seeking to be in the mind of somebody else, they need to do a lot of gut checks on themselves. So one of the concepts I often talk about is ego suspension, that you sometimes need to suspend your ego temporarily if the mission is more important than trying to influence somebody that has a different value set than you might. You can't judge that person because they have different values. It's just different. Um, By far, one of the most amazing stories that I learned was um, a military intelligence officer was in 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 desert. You know, one of one of the many places, unfortunately, where our military is. Mm -hmm. And um, there was an IUD, and two of the uh, Humvees had exploded and then they went out looking for, the, they happened to see a person, they tracked down the person, brought him back for very quick interrogation, asking them, are there more up ahead? Like this is again, life and death, high stress. Yep. And the intelligence agent that I talked to is the, per- is the person that has to talk to this other human being who just killed his friends, Mm. who definitely wants to kill more of his friends and doesn't believe anything that he stands for. And yet they actually had a very cordial, calm conversation. And through that conversation, that man told them, actually, there is two more bombs up ahead. Wow. That's amazing. So you have to be able to suspend your ego sometimes, but you don't know, you can't suspend your ego if you're not self-aware enough to know that there's a contrast. And um, yeah, that's another reason why I love what I do because that's the power of communication is you think that you're learning about everybody else, but you're really learning more about yourself, which helps you learn more about other people. It's a very beautiful cycle. That's awesome. That sounds, I mean, and that's a really powerful example of how getting information in a way by, by really being introspective, you really kind of move forward in your life in that sense, that was literally a life in death situation. So yep. that's very powerful. Yep. Um, tell me about uh, some of the biggest challenges that young people face today in becoming an entrepreneur. 
Yeah. So yeah, go ahead. I I started my business in uh, my early twenties, and I so I've been in business for over ten years. You guys can do the math. Um, <laughs> and when I started, and you asked the question, well, how do I get found? How do I get noticed? It was very straightforward. So I started out as a professional speaker, and the piece of advice was. Well, you go to the library, there's this big book of all the associations, you find out which association you want to get connected to and you reach out to them. Um, the internet was a thing, I'm not that old, but it wasn't as big of a thing as it is now. Mm -hmm. So now entrepreneurs, it's not one direct line of advice. It's Facebook, Twitter, LinkedIn, I, TikTok is now a thing that I don't understand. Um, you know, all of these, uh, there's still snail mail is still a thing. There's mm -hmm. all of these ways that you can still get your message out there and market yourself. But oh my gosh, which one's the right one? Which one do you choose? And I think where most people go wrong is they really try to accomplish all of them, that they they try a shotgun approach through their marketing and messaging when really and truly laser focus still is king when it comes to this. Choosing one platform, choosing one way to communicate to people, and then you, you build your expertise around that, and then you move on to the next uh, platform. So it's really, really difficult. It requires a lot of discipline. You will get a lot of advice from people saying, oh, don't waste your time on Facebook because such and such is the next big thing and shiny object syndrome is difficult i love all things glitter so i get it my eyes just like what do you got like i understand and so you have to build a sense of self-trust to trust your compass to trust that energy um wherever it's pointing you and stick with it because by the end of the day consistency consistency, consistency. If you jump from one platform to the next or try a different method or try a different funnel, you won't have enough data and you won't learn enough to be able to really craft the message that's going to make a difference. Mm -hmm. So I'd say that, so if you were porting that, that those ideas to kind of a specific technology, maybe entrepreneur idea, then you probably think about Make sure that, like you said, if you're consistent, so if, say you're thinking about creating a startup in virtual reality or something, uh, what you're saying then is, if, I'm, if I listen right, that you really need to understand everything that that industry has to do, where it is at the same time, uh, at the moment that you start researching it, research where it's going to go, reach out to all the experts that are out there, reach out to friends that are uh, in that industry. Um, Right. Yeah. So I think I think you're touching on uh, an adjacent point to that. So one is choose your platform, stick with it, stay consistent with that. What you're touching on is, I think, the research aspect of the industry and and uh, making sure you're an expert in your field mm -hmm. from a communication and message standpoint, because that's my area of expertise. Yeah. Um, to piggyback off of that idea, I would say you want to get a pretty good range of, again, what are the vibes of investors in that area? What are the vibes of people who already own companies in this area, your competitors? And then all the way down to what are the vibes of our consumers of this product? Because once you figure out how is it that other people are thinking about this thing that I want to make money from, now you can pull key phrases from them and incorporate it into your messaging. So yes, talking to as many people as you can to get that full spectrum. But keep in mind, there's not one group of decision makers that you are going after. There are multiple and each decision mm. maker needs its own avatar from investors to competitors, to purchasers, to retailers, to like, all of them have their own specific concerns, specific identifiers, beliefs, and specific goals. Really great. Thanks so much for that answer. That, that, that is clarifying and it's very good. Um, I was gonna say, I was gonna ask you a question uh, before about there, there's a lot of people that attend App Academy and I'm just reading this off from some of the questions I have here is obviously a lot of the students are high achieving, well-educated people that decide to switch careers. 
Do you know many people uh, through your work that have made a serious career switch like many of the students here? And if so, what are some of the qualities that help them successfully make that move? Yeah, man, there's a lot there. So I would say an unwavering belief in yourself. Mm -hmm. I know that that sounds perhaps cheesy or woo woo, but it's the truth. When you make a big change, as I have, I, again, I pretty much shortly out, out of college, I started my entrepreneurial journey. Then at some point in there, I started another business with a business partner. Then that relationship changed. And so now no longer have business partner. I don't want to be in that company anymore. So now I have to rebrand entirely. Like, been through many changes that scared the bejesus out of me. So um, with that said, when you make a big change, a lot of people around you are not going to understand it. Mm -hmm. They will, a lot of people who are especially not entrepreneurs or not entrepreneurially, entrepreneurial, entrepreneurially, uh, you know what I mean, right. <laughs> minded, um, they don't understand our risk tolerance. Mm. They don't understand um, our need and desire to forge our own way. Human beings are ten tend to be wired for the most part towards safety and familiarity. So when you're breaking out away from that security blanket, a lot of people aren't going to understand it. And so this is this is one of those gray areas. On one side, you have to have unwavering belief in yourself. On the other side, you still need to be self-aware enough to hear good advice when it comes by. So you got to listen to those trusted advisors that tell you, you know, just a little course tweak, you know, maybe turn two degrees this way. And so it's not, it's not a black and white thing. Uh, it never is and it never will be. But ha finding that blend of unwavering belief and still being open to valuable advice not advice that comes out of fear or scarcity but valuable advice and then that's just how you find that that course to where you want to go that sounds very familiar i think around here i think for anybody that really is starting a business with uh, in regards to really creating a really strong focus in your life and to try to clear out a lot of peripheral things that can yeah. get in the way of that right and it's tough because some of those peripheral things are your mom and your dad <laughs> right, and exactly. your spouse and you know you have to make the best decision for you and your ecosystem by the end of the day i think that that's something that they talk about here at, uh, at app academy which is when they uh they say it's like you know 12 weeks is three months of building your skill from zero to being able to get a job over a hundred thousand dollars, and uh, you know that's not easy. That requires an insane level of of passion, but literal, quite literal, uh, just hourly, day to day hard work, and that involves a hundred hours a week sometimes. And mm -hmm. um, and I think that that's something that anybody starting out in any business probably is is uh, you know really understands. I have a friend that started his own security company here in San Francisco and he goes beyond uh, beyond even those numbers and that's difficult for uh, some of his old old time friends to you know say hey let's go watch a movie and he's like well I really need to build this sure. uh, you know this part of my business and even if it's Saturday at 10 p.m if that's when he decided to work on that then uh, as us as the peripheral uh, friends that are supportive, uh, need to kind of understand that. So th I think that's a great example. So thank you for that. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, let's look at uh, interviews. So uh, interviews are a very important part of the process to get into the tech industry, as we all know, or any industry really. Mm -hmm. uh, what are some of the top tips that you have given your clients about doing well at interviews? So um, I think one of the biggest follies, this applies to interviews and to I mean, communication in general is operating under assumptions. And the worst is operating under assumptions due to fear. And so this is very true in interviews is for some reason, understandably, I get it. You feel the pressure to have, again, what should I say to have the right answer? 
that's not always necessarily the case. You still should be asking questions. If you don't understand something, clarify. If one of the best things that you can do is repeat a phrase back to somebody. Mm -hmm. So if they say, oh, you know, well, around here we use the accelerator 2000 and you don't have to say, I'm unfamiliar with an accelerator 2000. You can just say the accelerator 2000, huh? And then they'll probably elaborate a little bit further. So even repeat phrases with, a, a, you know, uh, up talk at the end can keep keep the conversation going, let them give you the more information that you need. And if you still don't have it, keep asking questions. Mm -hmm. One of the worst things that people do is just assuming that they understand what, uh, like jumping to the conclusion of, oh, well, I'm supposed to know what this is, so I better fake it till I make it. Mm -hmm. You put yourself in too many precarious situations. And keep in mind, this is true of relationships, this is true of working with clients. This is true of interviews is assuming, I mean, we all know the phrase, right? So being brave enough to ask questions to clarify. Now, this is a whole other subject, but in essence, this is the world of elicitation. And that's, that's the world of spies. And it's one of my favorite things to teach is how to get people to give you more information without them feeling like they're being interviewed or interrogated. Um, again, I just, I got to mention the blog because it has years of content there. So go over to the blog, check out some techniques. It's, it's all there. Awesome. Thank you. Yeah. Um, let's, uh, move, move on to, uh, I guess you, I, you also did mention this, uh, on the blog and I've seen you talk about this before. It's kindness, simple mm -hmm. term, not so simple to do it in <laughs> real life, right? It's so hard to, especially again, we're talking about really focused people. We have a lot of things to do all the time, seemingly, even though we have everything at our disposal to make things easier. It seems that we have less and less time to listen to each other, to have thoughtful, kind conversations to other people. Mm. So uh, you say that this is a very important personal quality that can affect your career. Mm. So again, for these people that are watching this, that may have just graduated from this boot camp or anybody else in uh, in the middle of their career, uh, please explain what uh, your perspective is on the importance of kindness in a career. I love that you asked this because this is one of my favorite topics that I don't get to talk about too often. So, kindness. Um, as high achievers, we are gold medalists at self criticism. I mean, we do it 24 seven, even in our sleep, we're critiquing our dreams or whatever it is. And there's two phrases that come to mind in around this concept of kindness that has made a big difference in my life. The first one is you cannot, um, not struggle. You cannot punish your way to success. Mm. Meaning you if you hate every step of the journey, then once you reach that financial goal, you broke your first million, you bought your dream house, whatever that is, you're still the miserable bastard that you started out as on day uh -huh. one. Uh -huh. I don't know if you and your other viewers have discovered this, but life is freaking short. It ends way too soon. I don't care if you live in to be over a hundred. So why are you punishing yourself during the journey, which is the vast majority of what we do? The goal is a fraction of our life. The journey is the biggest part. So why would you choose the pain, frustration, criticism every step of the way? I get it. It's difficult. It's much easier to be mean to yourself than it is to be kind to yourself. Mm -hmm. But making that choice to celebrate the small wins, to give yourself a self high five, to appreciate your work as you get your reps in towards this goal makes you not only live a better life and a happier life, you, it, you makes, it makes you kinder to yourself and therefore kinder to others. And then, so once you're kinder to yourself, now let's talk about being kind to others. People are dumbfounding. They, they do things that we don't understand and it's frustrating, especially when it works against us. And yet it's also true that of every single person, 
if we had the capability to top to jump into the TARDIS over here and go back in time and watch their life, it would make sense how they came to this action, they came to this decision. Because nothing happens in a vacuum. We are the result of a series of events and decisions and traumas and everything. And so if we were to understand someone, now this mean-spirited, harsh, I mean, of course, there's always extremes, but still just keeping it in our sphere. Mm -hmm. You understand those things. And now through understanding, you can have a little bit more compassion, a little bit more kindness. This is not to say that you should let people hurt you or step over you or anything like that. It's mm -hmm. simply to not react in our primal mode of fight when that slight actually wasn't intended to be a slight and all those misunderstandings, all of that. So with that, as we are dumbfounded by people and things that they may say or do, I turn to a phrase that is from a Patton Oswalt stand-up. And it's a phrase that apparently his, his wife who passed away used to say all the time. And it's, the world is chaos, be kind. Mm. We are all living in chaos. We're all scared. We're all afraid. We're all hurt. We're all wounded. Just choose kindness for yourself and others because the world isn't fair. It's just not. But what do you say to somebody who is, you know, moving up at a Google or an Airbnb or some of these other companies that are, you know, very focused and there's a lot of competition, uh, you know, kind of embedded into the fabric of the very company that, you know, just because they're, you know, I'm sure 20 different startups that we're thinking about, let's create an apartment type uh, software that'll help you get an apartment in Italy or something like that. So a lot of the people that started those types of companies, they, you know, set that up within their company. Um, and maybe, and this is true because I've, I've, you know, I've lived in the Bay Area for about 20 years, but uh, I think I feel like a lot of people are maybe trapped in the competition and might be afraid to be kind uh, because they might feel like uh, the executives might feel like they're not strong enough or tough enough. What do you say to that? So this is a perfect example of beliefs. And I want to point that out for the viewers that that there is a belief that you just shared in what you just described. And the belief is that competition and kindness can't go together. And so that's a belief. That's not necessarily true. That's not necessarily false. But through what just listening to you, that's now a belief that I would have my little antenna would influence antenna would go up and say, is this a belief that I should or could validate? Or is this a belief that I should or could debunk? So now, just to answer your question, um, I am not of the belief that kindness and competition cannot coexist. I believe that they can. I believe that seeing um, sportsmen, you know, at the, athletes at the highest level, yeah, they're competitive. And yeah, they will go for the goal, but they still can be kind. Um, and I think that that's true in Silicon Valley and any industry you still have the option to choose kindness no matter how competitive it, it is. There's competitiveness does not equal ruthlessness. Ruthlessness is ruthlessness. Competitiveness is simply when we're all trying to reach a goal and let's see who wins. Mm -hmm. When you reach the finish line, or even if you don't, you still can be kind. Yeah, thank you for that answer because it also reminds me of what a lot of, uh, you know, some of the major founders of Silicon Valley, uh, and it kind of connects to your idea earlier in the interview, which was the use of language and understanding, you know, what you're talking about. You know, you hear somebody like Steve Jobs, and he was considered to be this ruthless individual in many ways. Mm. So a lot of people coming up believe that that's, they have to be like Steve Jobs in that particular way, but it doesn't mean that maybe what worked for him would work now. It's a different time maybe he maybe the way that he was wouldn't work now because there's different expectations right All right and and that goes to to the article that is up on your guys platform now and that is comparison avoidance uh -huh. comparison is dangerous in general but if you are wanting to be like somebody else you're already on the back foot because you cannot be somebody else you 
your real magic, your real power is how can I enhance the best parts of me? How can I bring more of myself to this? Because if you're trying to be like somebody else, you will always fail because you won't. And when it comes to comparison avoidance, which I'm sure we'll talk about at some point, mm-hmm. when you're trying to not be like somebody else, you you still are all you still have that person in in your mind as a mile marker. They are still a reference point. They shouldn't be a reference in the world that you're creating around you. It should come. I mean, I, again, I know it sounds a little woo woo, which is weird for me because I'm not super woo. But <laughs> when it comes to entrepreneurship, you have to have these internal checks for yourself. You have to be able to have these grounding conversations with yourself because it's very easy to get pulled all different directions. And now it's just pieces of you that is trying to go towards something. And it's, it's, mm-hmm. It will not work. Interesting. Uh, yeah, let's go into the into the article a little bit. So you mentioned. So this was the uh, for viewers that are watching this. You can go to blog.appacademy.io and you can find uh, Cherie's article on the one thing that. Let me make sure I have the right title. It is the one bad thought holding back entrepreneurs. And do you want to get into it a little bit? Why did you decide to write this article? And um, what are you trying to get across to people? From sure. This? So the article comes from a lot of conversation, a, a lot of conversations I've had with clients and, and colleagues. And that is, I mean, I, I teach the world of influence. And so within my industry of influence, there's a lot of schizoids out there. There's a lot of guys teaching slimy techniques, you know, just teaching things that like you don't feel good as a person doing it but this person said that you're supposed to so I guess maybe I'm supposed to um and so in my world I as I started my business I tried so hard to not be compared to those people I tried not to do the things that they were doing even though they were strategies that were working I didn't want to jump into email marketing right away. I didn't want to jump into making videos the way that they did or webinars the way they did. And so as a result, I wasn't doing email marketing. I wasn't doing webinars. I wasn't doing this. I wasn't doing that. And I am not the only one guilty of this. Plenty of my clients, when they ask me, oh, you know, I want to put together this thing, but I don't want to come across like insert person here. I hear the name Gary Vaynerchuk a whole lot. I just don't want to be like Gary Vaynerchuk because he rubs them the wrong way. Okay, fine. Um, I, there were people that would love to be like Gary Vaynerchuk. I have no judgment here. Um, I, you know, There's tons of people that they will say, I just don't want to be like. Well, as a result, that person that you don't want to be like doesn't give a flying fuck. You said I could curse on this. I'm just letting you know. <laughs> yeah, go ahead. Thank you. <laughs> Uh, I don't give a flying fuck what you what your worry is because that person is still out there on the megaphone doing what they do. You not wanting to be like Gary V is not stopping Gary V from being Gary V and getting the money that he does and doing the deals that he does. Um, and so, it, but you are sitting back not moving forward, you're procrastinating, you're creating all these mental blocks because you don't want to potentially be viewed like so-and-so, whoever that is for you. And that kind of comparison avoidance holds you back, holds back good entrepreneurs. And I mean good entrepreneurs because these are the type of people that are worried about it, that they are concerned about their image. It's the egotistical megalomaniac narcissists who do not have these com- conversations with themselves, who will use any technique, who will do whatever it takes. Mm. And so who, who are you serving? You, out of comparison avoidance, are now leaving the only voice, the loudest voice, to be the megalomaniacs, and you're silent. Who suffers? Your marketplace suffers. Because now they only have those people to turn to because you didn't want to be compared to that person and now they don't have the information, the help, the service from a good person like you. So that's, it came from so many conversations I've had with people about it. And I would love for people watching this to do a gut check and ask themselves, 
what are the things that I know I should be doing, but I have been holding back because so-and-so did it and it rubbed me the wrong way. Wow, that's really interesting. Really powerful because I think uh, I'm sure a lot of us do this and maybe sometimes even, I think that what you would describe is consciously, but I'm sure that a lot of this stuff can also be unconscious uh, because I don't want to be that way. I don't do this, blah, 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 blah. But then you might be missing it out on an opportunity. And maybe if I'm understanding it right, I could probably do something like this in my own way that serves my own values, that makes me succeed in my own way, that could potentially be in, in an external way even better than that comparison, right? Nailed it. Exactly. Because the beautiful thing is once you find your own voice, once you find your own way, once you find the perfect way for you to do it and it starts to take off, next thing you know, now you start seeing copycats of you. And that's when you know you really hit on something special. And for those of you that once you hit that spot, I want you to remember, because I've been in that position and it, it scared me. I was like, oh my God, they're taking away my special thing. They're copying me. <laughs> Don't worry about it. They will still never be able to have the unique imprint that you have. So mm. again, that comes back to that unwavering belief in self. So let's bring that back. So I think that's such a powerful idea. Let's bring that back to and take it away from the executive suite and like really thinking about people starting out in the industry, in any industry, even though this focuses on the technology industry. But, you know, what would you say? How do you how do or maybe on a day to day basis, uh, regular people, can, how can they implement this sort of comparison, avoidance, uh, rejection? in a day-to-day -day life when they are starting out, trying to learn a new skill, trying to move on to maybe get the next great project that could really help them uh, move up in their company. Yeah, I get that. Um, it comes down to the other thing that we were talking about, and that's kindness. Just be kind to yourself on the journey. You're going to make mistakes. You're going to go left when you should have gone right. You're still learning something. You are a student now. And for a lot of us, it's probably been a really long time since we've been an active student. And that learning process is you take a few steps, you trip, you fall down, you try again. But being like, oh my gosh, I can't believe that I you know, did this and that. And okay, great. So how long do you wanna waste energy on that? Do you wanna waste an hour? Do you wanna waste a day? Because most people waste weeks, months, years. So it comes down to just being kind to yourself as you're learning, as you're doing something new. Mm -hmm. Cool. Thank you for that answer. Um, let's talk about, uh, we probably have a couple of questions left. One that I wanted to explore was, um, you talk a lot about ideas. You, again, you, your work is with a lot of entrepreneurs, a lot of creative people. Mm -hmm. You yourself are a creative person. Uh, how do you uh, suggest people, maybe, maybe you can provide some tips about how, how to find new ideas. Could be somebody creating an app, could be somebody writing a novel or something like that. Oh, this is another one of my topics I don't get to talk about very much. Fun. Um, cool. So the book, there's one, I attributed this to one book and it's, the book is called The Medici Effect. I'm so sorry. I cannot remember who wrote it. Um, I feel terrible about that right now. But the concept of the Medici Effect is he tracks a number of um, breakthroughs, like in science or architecture. And if memory serves me correctly, like, when there's a very creative architect looking at what to, how this next building sh would look, should look, instead of looking at buildings and other buildings, he looked to a completely different quote unquote industry or world. And he looked at ant farms and the natural world and how maybe trees, the cells and trees structure themselves and then found inspiration to bring into architecture. So looking outside of your field of expertise is what fuels your field of expertise. Mm. So for example, I wanted to work with entrepreneurs and do business, but I ended up going to the agency and talking to CIA field operatives and spies. And I talked to hostage negotiators. I never wanted to go into law enforcement. I mean, yeah, I want to be James Bond like everybody else, but besides the movie fantasy, I had no desire, but bringing that field into mine is what created more ideas. 
I get more ideas in my business by not spending time in my business, watching YouTube videos that have nothing to do about business. Um, I, I've gotten into looking at photography and filming things, and that has fueled ideas for blog articles on communication that it has never done before. So being very diverse in what you consume makes you produce better, more focused things on the thing that you're wanting to put out there. Um, I think it's a real big mistake when people just only live, breathe, and eat their world. Like you mentioned VR, only living, breathing, eating VR. Bro, you got to step out a little bit, you know, because you will find your best ideas outside of that world. Otherwise, it's just incestuous, incestuous. Like everybody's getting the same information, and feeding off of the same information. Well, great. No wonder everything's homogenous. I was going to say that sounds like a, <laughs> like a potential. Uh, uh, you're kind of describing the the curated worlds of certain social networks that shall not be named. You know. <laughs> so. Sure. Yeah. Really interesting. Cool. So find your uh, find something new in your life, everybody. So let me see if I can find another question that I had. Just because, you know, I went through your blog and there's so much to talk about. It's really interesting. Um, I guess uh, maybe let's just bring this question back to you. What's something else that you think that we haven't talked about that <laughs> Uh, from your experience in, and you know, as a communication expert, that somebody could do maybe this week, say like they're watching this thing and say, you know, I have so many things to do in my life. I have so many potential sources that can help me. What is something doable that could help me be a better communicator in my life or in my career? So I would say, and it kind of ties into how you frame that question as well. So the thing with influence is influence isn't just communication. Influence is communication with a goal, meaning you can be a phenomenal communicator. You could understand everything that I'm saying and, and take it in and I can articulate beautifully. And that means I'm a good communicator. But if there is no action that I am driving you towards no behavior, no thought, no emotional change, then I'm just communicating, I'm not influencing. But in order for me to influence, I have to have a goal in mind. This is where most people miss the mark. They either don't have a goal at all, or their goal is framed around the concept of what they do not want. I wish my boss would stop calling meetings 10 minutes ahead of time. I really hate it when my coworker stops by my office um, at noon. Like you are very, people tend to be very clear on what they do not want. But when you ask them, what do you want? They go, well, I want him to stop. No, no, no. That's what you don't want. What do you want? Oh, well, and that's the first time they take the pause to consider the, the actions, the behaviors that they do want to see. And so the only way to set a goal is to have something that you can see, some, something that somebody can do, something that they can say or, you know, that you can recognize. Trying to stop behavior is not nearly as effective as trying to create or, you know, shift towards the behavior that you do want to see. The problem is people just don't know what they want to see. So ask yourself. How would I know that my boss respects my time? So they might say like, oh, well, I want him to respect my time. Great. How would you know he's doing that? I don't know. And great. Now this is part of the thought process because the more clarity you have around that, now your message can be more specific and drive to that clarity. So to, yeah, when you guys are at home this week, I would start thinking of, what are the things that you're wanting to create and change? And then ask yourself, how would I know it happened? While also being really as much as introspective as you can, right? Really understanding where you are, where you want to go, and what, um, what you kind of like being real to, with yourself too, right? Yeah. Uh, so what it takes. Another misconception that a lot of people have is that influence happens quickly. Um, the influence that you notice tends to happen quickly. 
but the true influential process has lasted much longer than you realize. So again, I'll turn to the CIA. They, they don't have missions that last like five minutes on the street when they grab the person and put them in the black SUV like you see in the movie. Yeah. That, that whole scenario of them grabbing them in the SUV took minimum, minimum three months to plan. Some of the missions of, hey, there's this really high level person at such and such embassy. We know that they can have access to the information that we need. How can we turn them into an asset? That can be a year, two, three year, five year mission. But that timeline, you have to be able to, you have to acknowledge, give yourself more time. I guess that's, that's what it boils down to is yes, we would all love to have things yesterday, but having one interaction with somebody and hoping to influence them to hire you for, you know, half a million dollar job offer. I mean, it absolutely could happen and I wish you the best and I hope it does, but the bigger, the goal, the longer the timeline. So work that into your plans. Awesome. Well, thank you so much for being with us today, Shari. This has been awesome. And uh, we hope to see more of your writing on the App Academy blog. And uh, uh, people should check out that article. Again, the title is, I'm going to go into it again. It is The blog. One Bad Thought Holding Back Entrepreneurs. <laughs> and uh, again, just go to the blog, blog.appacademy.io. And you can also check out uh, Shari's um uh, articles and uh find out more about her at shari.alexander.com so if anybody wants to send any questions we'll put it up and uh we're going to ask uh, shari and myself will be online to answer any any questions uh through text obviously on the platforms cool. um, if that's possible cool thank you cool. so much thanks so much take care